Good evening. My name is Heidi Frail, and I am the co-chair of the Needham Housing Advisory Group, opening our meeting for Wednesday, October 18th, 2023. Um, this meeting is virtual only. Um, and uh, just to start, I just want to say that my co-chair, Natasha Espada, will be joining us as soon as she is able. Um, and... I just want to say welcome to everyone. Uh, we're just, this evening's meeting is primarily to decide on the, or to, to plan out um, the format for the community meeting, which will be our next meeting on November 9th. Um, in our last meeting, we discussed at great length what we should bring to this meeting. And now this meeting is to talk about how everything should play out and to plan out all the logistics. So um, at our last meeting, Emily Innes, and, um, oh my gosh, Eric Halvers Halverson, am I saying your name right? Yes, Halverson, um, did a fabulous presentation of uh, the two um, models that they laid out with uh, our MBTA compliance modeling. And we discussed what we're gonna bring, which was the existing, um, the existing zoning, and then a plan for the, that um, shows the, uh, housing plan working group model. Um, and they're going to go through that with us tonight to show what uh, they've come up with as a presentation method. And then we're going to talk about how that's going to be presented. Um, we'll also hear from Amy Hilson uh, with some review of our outreach strategy. So I guess um, I'm going to turn it over to Emily, correct? Emily and Eric. Turn it over to Eric. <laughs> okay, I'm going to turn it over I'm to dodging. Eric. I'm dodging and sending it straight to him. <laughs> Bob and Weave. <laughs> All right. Um, through the chair, I need to make an adjustment to our agenda tonight. Um, sure. We realized uh, slightly before the meeting that the general residence district in all of our modeling is not accurate. Um, after the last meeting, when we made the adjustments to the dwelling units per acre to the general residence, if you remember that from two to eight, mm -hmm. my understanding in making that adjustment was that although the zoning currently says you can do a two family on a 10,000 square foot lot, and we sort of adjusted that to say, well, that means you could do eight units per acre if you just do the math. In reality, the zoning only allows a two-family home regardless of the size of the parcel. So even if you had a 20-acre parcel or a 10,000-square-foot parcel, you can only do two units. Therefore, that violates the MBTA law, which says you have to have three units or more to be counted as multifamily. I did not realize that, uh, so that's my mistake, and I apologize. Um, so I don't want to show the modeling results tonight because they're moot. Um, there's really no point in doing that. Um, I will uh, remodel everything tomorrow and I can send uh, Lee and, and Alex and Katie the results of that um, to share back out with the committee if, uh, through the chair if that's appropriate or however you'd like me to handle it. So Eric, can I just ask, doesn't the... I mean, given that even at eight, it didn't meet the requirements, or that was that was my recollection in any case, does it matter that much? Well, not from a from a density standpoint, it it may not. Uh, we may still be short on under the existing zoning. Um, but from like the uh, unit capacity, like total number of units, and also just the acreage that we're talking about and percentages, I, I would wanna, I would want to remodel that just so that we're working from the right numbers and presenting the most accurate numbers possible to the public uh, in November. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then, uh, given this, what's your suggestion about how to proceed? Um, I don't think this prevents us from talking at all about the meeting itself and the run of show, uh, the presentation, um, the mock-up boards that Emily did. I think we can still talk about all that. Um, the only thing I would say is as we're running through those things, 
I am going to work under the assumption that whatever is labeled as GR, we probably won't share with the public unless there's the strong feeling amongst the committee that you would want to make changes to the zoning under the housing plan to allow for more than more than basically a duplex on a lot. Okay. Uh, my, my, my screen, I've never seen this before, is translating what people say and printing it on the screen. Does anybody know how to make that go away? <laughs> um, it looks like maybe you've enabled closed captioning. En enabled what? Closed captioning. Captioning. At the bottom, if you bring your cursor to the bottom of the screen, you can see there's a little CC icon. A little what icon? It's like a little, two little C's in a white box right next to the participants and raise your hand. Being on my screen, it's between record and um, uh, raise your hand. It says show captions on it. Just put your cursor down at the bottom of your screen. Participants, oh, why does this keep disappearing? Uh, raise hand, oh, CC, there it is, CC. Okay, so Try clicking that and see. Oh, yeah. Every time I touch the screen, I, it gives me some kind of strange things. Oh. Um, aside from that, Jean, did you? Oh, have I'm a sorry, I'm right? just having so much trouble. I don't know. Um, no, go ahead. I'll just see if I can fix this. But okay. Um, all right, so Eric, did you still want to move forward then? Yeah, I would love to move instead directly to the public meeting, if that's okay with the committee. Yes. Okay. Uh, that, I mean, that's fine with me. Uh, everyone okay. okay with that? Yep. Okay, super. Excuse me, well, can I ask a couple of questions while we're still on the model? Yeah. Or we might have more time. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I did just want to, I, I think this is right. So the, the modeling that you're using, this is a model that comes directly from the state. So it's not like something that reflects your your choices or something like that. So uh, because, um, you know, I had raised this question about um, how the model doesn't seem to, the model seems to deviate from the actual experience that we have, I, I, I believe is the case. And I guess Gene can confirm this, but my understanding is that all the A1 areas actually do have 18 units per acre times the entire 28 acres. And yet the model is saying it's 359, I believe. Uh, is that just basically, uh, is it just a situation that's what the model says? So we have to go by the model regardless of what the actual reality is? Um, I would say you're, I think you're partially correct in that assumption. This is the model that the state is requiring everyone to use. So you're correct about that. Um, the model, it, the model can do a lot. It can't model every single component of a municipality zoning that may then translate to a different development outcome on the ground, if that makes sense. So although it, I, you know, I think it does a pretty good job, it's never going to represent exactly what you see on the ground today. It just, it just can't. Uh, the right. model had to, had to be built to accommodate 177 different communities and 177 different types of zoning times all the different zoning districts that every municipality has uh, mm -hmm. or may, or may choose to create. So, it, it does take it does take some liberties with some of the assumptions that may differ from what you see on the ground today. Um, so that's why, uh, Michael, you do see a difference between you know what is built, say, at 18 dwelling units an acre, and what the model might estimate. But we do need to go with what the model says. But I will say, if you know, there always is the opportunity. I know this is easier said than done, but there is always the opportunity to adjust the actual zoning to then have the model sort of reflect a potentially either a higher or maybe in some cases a lower uh, number of units or density or something like that. So there are opportunities to to make adjustments within the model. Okay, but as far as you understand, is the model going to be the final 
say on this or is in other words when you sit down with the we sit down with the office of the state and we submit our plan and the state i don't know if that's going to be you just submit it on paper and they're going to figure it out or if you meet with them or is is there going to be a way to meet with them and say okay the model is saying this but we actually actually have this much in this space um or vice versa maybe it, it could overcount in some case in some case as well but is there going to be an opportunity to explain deviations in a way that makes sense or is it going to be the model is the arbiter and and whether that matches reality doesn't matter it's just what the model says uh i i guess professional opinion and it's not based on any experience i've had with hlc just what i think will happen is you're going to submit your compliance application. I believe it's an online portal that you submit everything everything through along with all your documentation. And they're going to look at that and that's it's going to be what it's going to be. I don't think they're going to allow you to deviate unless there was some really major extenuating circumstance or very something very unique to your community. Okay. Although although reality would seem to be like actual reality would seem to be a pretty good basis, but um and then as far as the um, GR district, because um, I had had a question on that, but I think it's been mostly mooted, but um, I was going to ask about, I was going to try to ask about that last week, because my understanding was you have to have three units um, or two buildings to constitute, um, uh, to constitute multifamily housing under the rule. So if we wanted to do the, 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 the GR, that would have, we would have to, rezone that to three or three or more right okay. yeah correct okay um let me check i had one other thing emily you look like you have something you want to add oh. yeah i just wanted to to um echo what eric said about the compliance model but just add that they'll be looking at both the compliance model and the actual text of the zoning um, it's it's not just the numbers, it's also what you've said in words that's allowed, uh, but in terms of how the unit capacity is determined, it will be what the model shows and then double checking that the zoning doesn't belie that, uh, that unit capacity. Okay. And then the one other thing was, I think I had asked this last week, but I was having trouble um, hearing, but had to do with the... Um, uh, Since we're zoning to a maximum of 18, yeah, the question was how, how can areas like the business, I don't know if this is because we have certain overlays that are outstanding, but why things like the business district would be 21.4 and, and uh, some others would be greater than 18 if we're talking about a maximum of 18. Do you mean by zoning? Are you talking about the unit density? Um, this is in the housing. Let's see, this Ro was in Ro the scenario. This is in the scenario for modeling. So it was uh, page eleven. There were a couple that were above eighteen, even though I thought we were zoning to a max of eighteen. I think the issue there was that the two districts that you talked about, the industrial district and the business district, don't have embedded in them uh, a maximum eight, of 18 units per acre. Oh. So the only thing that's governing are the dimensional requirements of the district. And so in those districts, you're able to actually create more units per acre because that constraint doesn't exist. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Jean, did you have a question? Uh, yes. It. it it doesn't surprise me, um, it was a question I was going to ask tonight, um, that um, multi, that our general residence does not comply. Um, we in the housing plan uh, committee never thought so because of the fact that it only allows two units um, per, per um, parcel. Um, although there are developments, I'm thinking of um, what's been before the planning board uh, these recent uh, weeks um, is a condominium development of Highland Avenue um, and way north, way north. Um, 
and I think I think it's just beyond one of the districts that you have portrayed. Um, and it's on uh, it is, it is uh, um, Cross Street and Putnam Avenue. Oh, okay. um, and it's it's right. It's near the Three Squares uh, restaurant, the one that's closed. If you know that on the left, if you're going out of town, that little condominium development has 12 units. Um, it's in the general residence district. And it was developed presumably by a single um, owner um, for a condominium that's now owned, you know, by 12 different people as a condominium. Um, so it's certainly possible. Well, uh, actually, Gene, that, that development, if you look at the plan for that development, although it looks like a like it's all happening on a singular lot. That's actually a total of of individual lots that front on Highland Avenue and front on the on the back street, and there are two family houses sitting on each singular lot. So it's oh, not uh, that's how that's oh. how that was done. So even though on the ground it reads that the way you're describing it in terms uh -huh. of the plan that implemented it, it was done differently. Oh, I thought when people came to the meetings and talked about, you know, I represent the condominium and I'm on the board of the condominium, that it was one big condominium. All right. Well, we, I think, we I think it functions talk. that I think it functions that way. But permitting wise, um, those you those 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 every two family is sitting on an on a separate lot and it meets the dimensional requirements for that lot. Right. OK, then um, I think. Um, I'd like, I have another question that, that goes to what Michael De Niro was asking, um, because um, I spent some time going through the um, zoning input summary tab of the 3A compliance model, um, focusing on um, the, the condominium development where I live, Rosemary Ridge, and seeing how all the different factors are calculated for Rosemary Ridge. And although it appears that we end up with um, um, 18.01 dwelling units per acre by the formula that that, um, that um, compliance model requires with all the different inputs, um, I think what the difficulty is, if I understand it, is that um, um, there are uh, setback requirements. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Emily or, or Eric, but there are setback requirements. So you uh, deduct the total acreage of the required setbacks. Um, there also, if there's wetlands, you deduct the wetlands. And actually, apartment A1 zoning does require a certain percentage of wetlands to be deducted anyway from the acreage. Um, that's in the zoning. Um, and something about parking spaces too. Um, the area that's devoted to uh, parking, um, um, you know, surface parking, you somehow you deduct that. I don't know how we ended up with 18, it gives any, 18 units anyway. But um, it, when in fact, our standard of 18 units per acre in the zoning is applied to the entire parcel, including the setback areas, the surface parking areas. Um, can, there's a column I know that is called, um, the column title is override developable. And then it, it seems like the next column is where you have a, notes for your like your explanation. Is there a way of overriding those factors by explaining how, uh, even though there is a setback requirement, it is included in the acreage and the units per acre is calculated based on, is there a way of getting around those factors? Um, so the override column and the notes column that are in the model, um, Gene, are specific to, um, I guess are subject to very specific requirements that HLC has put forward. And those are really to be used only for publicly owned land um, that oh. is currently excluded from the model and considered undevelopable. For example, if you had an old school that's no longer in use and the town is going through a public disposition process to put that 
parcel of land or that building out for reuse or, or redevelopment. Uh, depending on how far that parcel or building is along in the disposition process, HLC might allow the community to override that excluded land and count it toward its unit capacity. That's the whole reason why in the model we have the override. It's not really to override environmental conditions or you know override certain zoning restrictions. It's really about publicly owned land. Oh, okay. Thank you for that explanation. I was kind of looking for something that gives me a little hope that we could, you know, I don't know, make this fit our, our local zoning better than it does. Um, isn't it, it's kind of worrisome that um, and now we're, more, by not being able to use general residence, we would be very far from compliance. I don't know the answer to that, but I will soon. Yeah, let's let's put that on hold until we can actually see the models. Okay. Which, okay. You know, understandably, we, we had hoped that we would see tonight, but and and discuss it at greater length, but we'll be fine. Um. Okay. So, Eric, you have a presentation you were gonna put on, correct? I did, but uh, yeah, I'll just walk you through some <laughs> walk you through some other stuff. Um. What I would love to do is sort of walk through the public meeting materials in this order. One just walk through the run of show just so everyone has uh, a sense of what Emily and I have kind of laid out in coordination with Lee and Katie and Alex. Um, run, have Emily just run through the board mock-up really quick, which will be the primary activity at each of the now, I assume three stations instead of four. Um, I will run through what I had sent in that presentation in terms of just the outline of talking points and things that we'd like to mention in the introductory and then I would love at the end, if we have time and if appropriate, to just ask for volunteers um, for the different um, sort of positions that I had identified in the run of show. Make sense? Excellent. Okay. Make it so. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just going to share my screen. Um, Eric, um, I'm not hearing you very well. Are other people not hearing Eric well? Okay. Uh, Elizabeth this... says not either. Yeah. Is this you better? sound slightly muted. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Is that better? Yes. yes. Much better. Great. Um, okay. So let me just share my screen. Is everyone able to see this? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so this is the run show. I believe this was included uh, in the packet as well. Um, so just in case you're not aware, uh, November 9th, 7 uh, to 9 p.m. Uh, Powers Hall in Town Hall will be the location uh, and the start time. Uh, I'm sure Emily and I and uh, other members of our team will probably like to be there around five, if that's possible, for town staff, just so we have plenty of time to set up. Uh, if committee members would like to get there maybe around 6.30, I think that would be great, um, just so we can get into position, we can all get our stuff on and, and be ready. Um, so that would be great. I'll come back to the volunteer piece at the end, if that's okay, and just sort of skip forward to the different stations that um, we hope to have uh, folks participate in. So when everybody walks in, of course, we'll have the welcome and the sign in, the name tags. Um, Elizabeth, I saw your, I think I saw your email about the name tags. That's a great idea, something we've done before. So we'll get those uh, put together um, for the committee members and staff and consultants. Um, so I think as we may have mentioned, we'll we'll sort of have a we'll have a dedicated MBTA Q and A station. So for people who really want to get in the weeds, want to talk about the nuts and bolts of MBTA and 3A, um, just things that may not be appropriate for the sort of district stations. Um, I'll be over at the MBTA QA, Q and A station and we'll kind of have like a big board that we'll call a parking lot where people, if they don't, if they have thoughts and they don't want to talk about it, they can just put sticky notes on there. We can collect them and maybe that'll help us put together an FAQ that we could maybe post um, on the town's website or something like that um, going forward. So I'll be over there and I'll be able to answer um, all the questions specific to 3A and tell people why we're doing this and why we have to do this. So I can 
take those tomatoes uh, for everybody. Um, <laughs> then we'll have, as we discussed, the what I'm calling the zoning map station. So that'll be two large format um, maps, one of the existing zoning. So not what we presented, but what we we're going to present tonight, all the actual existing zoning districts, and then the housing plan proposal. And on the housing plan proposal map, we we had talked with, I think, Lee and Alex and Katie about trying to um, highlight or lift up in a way, maybe through shadowing or something, the things, the districts that are sort of added or changed through the housing plan proposal. This way, people can compare those two things in real time and sort of understand what the differences are uh, from the zoning perspective. We also, before getting into the district stations, um, we talked about having a station specific to the center business district and then having a couple of prompting questions at that station, such as, um, you know, what, what are folks' opinions on whether this should really be a mandatory mixed use district? Do we want to mandate that? Therefore, we can't count it, you know, as part of our 3A district. Um, would residents be open to allowing multifamily as of right and loosening the mandatory mixed use so that it could be counted? Um, and so we want to get people's opinions on that um, while we have the opportunity so that when we come together next as a group, you know, we have that input and, you know, the group can decide how we want to move forward. So those would kind of be the non-district stations that would cover, I think, a lot of the things we've discussed throughout the last two meetings. Um, then what the primary point of the meeting, as we talked about last time, would really be to get feedback on the different areas of the MBTA 3A district that we are uh, considering. Emily and I thought a lot about how we might break down that district because it is very linear and it's it's pretty big um, overall. Uh, we talked about like, do we do like a north and a middle and a south section or an east and a west? But the difficulty with, with that setup we thought was there's, there's multiple zoning districts to the north and to the center and to the south. So how do you ask people for their input on things like height or lot coverage or parking ratios or transitions into neighborhoods? Because if you ask those questions for a district that contains multiple zoning districts, it gets real messy because people might say, well, in GR, well, let's say, I guess GR is now a bad example. Uh, you know, in A1, I might be more comfortable with this height, but in, you know, maybe the industrial district, because there's a pocket of it in the middle of GR or something, I don't want that. So we decided it might be better to talk about zoning districts instead of components of the MBTA district, if that makes sense. So we would, in this case, have an industrial station, an A1 station, and we were going to combine, We, Emily, maybe we rethink since we could still have four stations breaking up the business districts in a way, but we were going to combine the, the business districts only because they run up and down the spine um, of the 3A. So we felt like those have a better chance of being combined. Um, but now we could think about opening that up to another station. So in this case, we would then ask um, participants okay, let's focus on the A1 district, for example. We would have a map of where those A1s are located within our overall MBTA 3A district. And we would say, based on where these are located and adjacencies and um, you know what we're trying to achieve here with MBTA zoning, how do you feel about what the height should be or the setback should be or the parking should be? As I think you may have seen in the mock-ups that Emily did and she'll, she'll sort of go over that. So we were thinking that if we're able to get feedback on the specific zoning districts themselves, we can bring that feedback back to the group at the next meeting and say, hey, actually people are you know, okay with maybe a little bit more height here versus what we have today, or all oh, they really like you know, these building examples or these parking examples. And that gets us to, I think what we talked about last time is, well, how do we get from the feedback to then crafting the zoning for these specific districts. So that's sort of how we're hoping to bridge, bridge that knowledge gap that I think we have right now. Um, for each of the stations, we have indicators for the levers um, that are kind of like slider bars, for example. And what we would love to do is give people small sticky dots and allow them to stick them sort of either up or down or in the middle on the lever where they feel most comfortable. And Emily and I were thinking that that's a really nice sort of visual cue for people to say, wow, actually a lot of people are really comfortable with this or this or this. 
And also when we're doing the report outs, we could share that board in front of the group and and just like visually, you can sort of instantly see really like where where people's opinions fell uh, throughout the night. I love that idea. And I love that people get to stick there. I mean, I think they'll do it, <laughs> you know, as opposed to to answering a question or something. It's, I think they'll yeah. participate. So I love that. I agree. I think that's a wonderful idea. Great. Um, so yeah, people don't, you know, some people just don't feel comfortable talking or asking questions so they can just do this, this, and this. And, you know, that's the end of the day, what we really need. So, um, but again, if people want to engage with us and ask questions, talk about their preferences, things they like, don't like, we'll have two people at each station. So there'll be plenty of ears to, to listen, which is really, again, to reiterate, that's the point of this meeting is to listen and to get feedback. Um, and then use all that to craft the the actual you know plan going forward. So, um, Emily, did I miss anything on that? You're on mute. <laughs> I think that uh, that covers it uh, as far as the in person portion of it. Absolutely. Um, any questions from the group just on that specifically, or any of the other stations? Yes. Um... Looking for the question bar here. Raise hand, um, if I may. Uh, um, I I figured I'd volunteer for the A one uh, table because I'm very familiar with uh, A one. Be serving on the board of a condominium, which is in this uh, district, and um, I'm very curious also to particularly see how the numbers work in the other um, sites that are currently zoned for and developed as. Um, multifamily housing under the A1 zoning. Um, one thing um, about your presentation on proposed uh, um, the scenarios for modeling uh, with the different maps that you included, um, the housing plan called for uh, rezoning some additional sites for apartment A1. Um, and uh, I didn't see those sites. And these are already developed uh, for multifamily housing. The two, the two that I'm particularly thinking of, are the uh, Avery School Apartments, which uh, if it were shown, it, it would be shown on um, um, uh, uh, District 1. It, it, uh, it would be um, right, it, right opposite the big blue area. <laughs> Um, is Avery School Apartments, which is a converted school uh, that is market rate of uh, condominium apartments. Um, so we just thought, well, of course we should add those because they will add to our numbers. Um, so that's one. And the other is um, the Stephen Palmer, and that's also a converted school. Now, Stephen Palmer currently is, um, the property is owned by the town, leased to an operator, it has been leased for, I don't know, 20 years at least, I think. The lease is almost up, and it's a very important thing for the town to just consider what they're going to do going forward. Um, it presently, it's, it's restricted in an odd way so that it doesn't even uh, it, it it doesn't even uh, it, it count on the um, you know the, the um, inventory uh, that's kept by uh, the state on how many affordable units you have, even though supposedly all, all the units are rented uh, for uh, below market prices. But that's another one we wanted to zone uh, mm -hmm. that building. We talked about this with them, Jean, um, Emily, and Eric. Believe that we can write a compelling argument to include that as yeah, those, particularly those two where they're already developed um and then um you know then the, it would be a question of other any other areas would like to similarly zone um i also denmark lane uh which is a little condominium development near the center of town um has been left off and that was one we were going to I mean why not Zone it is a is a multifamily condominium that's developed with the density we're talking about, and it seems like it should be rezoned. So um, I kind of marked up all these scenarios for modeling with all of these comments, and um, I could go on um, and 
I can share my marker because I I outlined. Well, I'm going off on oh, a tangent here. Yeah, since, since we don't have the map. Now. What was that? Well, since we don't have the maps tonight, um, maybe this is something that we could. I mean, you shared it, your markups um, just prior to the meeting. Yeah, with, uh, with we could do that. The, the chairs. Just make sure that they're included. Sort yeah. of when Eric redoes the map. I don't think okay. without anything to look at. I think this is it's a really yeah. hard conversation okay. to have. Okay. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's keep going. Okay. Great. Um, just on that thought, we are currently in the process of creating the existing zoning map, the large one, and the housing plan map. So if there are changes. Now would be the ideal time to get that to us tomorrow, if we can. Um, just saying that. Thanks. Um, okay, so just in terms of the outline, uh, in terms, you know, from a timing standpoint, um, the sign in and welcome. We find, in our experience, people tend to get there before the meeting. So some people tend to get there before the meeting. So that's why I say if we're there by six thirty, we're at the sign in table by six forty five, welcoming people as they sign in. We can sort of gauge how things are going. If there's a long line of people trying to get in, then we can maybe wait till about 7.10 before we start. I think there's plenty of time. Uh, if everybody's kind of in and, and things are going well earlier, we can always start earlier, but we can sort of make that call um, when we're there. Um, Heidi, I assume maybe you might want to make some remarks um, or both co-chairs might want to make just some introductory remarks for a few minutes. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Or, or staff. I mean, you know, just somebody, somebody to yeah. introduce it. <laughs> yep. Yep. We'll do. Okay. Great. Um, we would then have um, a hybrid presentation, which I think we can talk more about how, when I, Katie, whenever we're ready for that part, I think Emily and I can share some of our ideas for that. But the idea would be to have a hybrid presentation that would be shared via Zoom, hopefully. So I would be giving that presentation. Emily would be on the hybrid end, maybe in a different room in the building, um, sort of monitoring that and, and helping the hybrid component along. Um, and again, we'll talk about the components of that presentation after we go through the run of show. Uh, that would take about a ha uh, about 15 minutes or so. Um, we'll try to keep it brief like we've talked about. Then from 7.30 to 8.30, we'd have an hour for all of the stations. I think that should be plenty of time to get through three or four stations. Um, and then from 8.30 to 9, we would do report outs probably for about 20 minutes, maybe five minutes per station if we even need that. And then maybe just having the co-chairs or staff just talk about wrap up and next steps and closing remarks. Um, Katie, is it okay if I sort of jump into the ideas about hybrid? Yep, absolutely. Okay. So for the hybrid option, Emily and I were talking uh, last week about how we might be able to do that. Um, I think we'll sort of kind of go in and out of a true hybrid uh, meeting. So the presentation would be hybrid. So everybody would be listening to that both in person and online together at the same time. Um, we would then break for the activity portion from 7.30 to 8.30. Um, Emily and I talked about some potential ways in which through Zoom, we could actually set up the exact same activity for people to participate online, maybe using technology like Miro board. Um, I've asked one of my staff members to be online with Emily just to help with note taking and uh, hand, you know, typing out the sticky notes as people are talking if we use Miro board and putting them on the different levers. So I think there's a good way we can do the activity both online and of course in person. Um, then after that hour portion, we would move to the report out, which again would be hybrid. Um, the folks online would listen to the report outs from each of the in-person stations. Then Emily would report out on behalf of the online participants so that everybody kind of hears the feedback in real time. And then we would end both portions of the meeting, both the in-person and the, and the online piece. And just to add, as Eric noted, we can do the exact same um, workstations in the uh, online version. We would just do them sequ sequentially. So first we'd discuss A and then we'd discuss B and so forth and so on. And then be able to fill in our, uh, our levers the exact same way we'd be able to do in person. This is amazing. 
and um, it's, it's remarkably, you've made this sound like not kind of as complicated as I, I imagine it actually is in real life, but you've done a very nice job of making it seem <laughs> rational. Um, uh, one question, um, can we present this inform the results, the, re the report outs and the wrap up, can we present this information on the website following the meeting so that people who didn't have a chance to go can still see the results? Yeah, um, typically, uh, you know, a few days to a week after a public meeting, we usually put together like a PDF packet of, you know, we'll, we'll type up like all the comments from the MBTA board and how did people feel about the Needham Center activity or the center business activity. And then obviously these four big activity boards, we would type all those up. Um, a mix of like graphics and written written summary. And then, yeah, that could get posted essentially as a meeting summary. That would be great. For taping the hybrid meeting, people would be able to watch the whole meeting. They would see what's happening online. And then when we go back to the in-person meeting for the report out, they'd be able to watch that as well. So they'd have both options, right? Watching it all the way through or just seeing, as Eric points out, the recorded information about a week later. Okay, great. So we can put that recording on as well. Fantastic. Yeah, so um, Katie, I think we'll just have to have a discussion about the logistics of doing the hybrid, like where Emily could set up and just sort of how, you know, that, that would go, but I'm sure we can figure that out. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, and then I, I just included, unfortunately, it's sideways because I had to fit it on here, but um, I thanks to the town of Needham, they actually had this amazing uh, drawing online. So that made my life a lot easier. Um, so this was just kind of the setup just to give you an idea of what we were thinking. It seemed, I've never been to the room, but it seems like it's a pretty substantial room. So it looks like we'll have plenty of space to set things up, but people would come and sign in. We'd have rows of seats for the presentation in front of the stage. Um, we could, I figured we could sort of have the zoning maps as an introduction first as a stage so people could just get a sense of what is the overall idea. Then we would have folks move through the four, um, the four zoning stations or three or however many we have. We'd have the center business station and then we'd have the MBTA Q&A station at the end. I kind of put those two at the end only because we really want people to get through to make sure they get through the, the kind of four, um, zoning specific stations uh, at least that was my thought um but this will all be on easels and boards so if it doesn't look like it's working we'll have plenty of time to move things around it's you know, yeah. not a big deal i'm going to just mention one thing and this is not meant to be nitpicky um just in in practical use um the largest doors and the place where most people will be entering the hall is right in front of that a1 district station so just to think about uh, okay. because they don't they don't usually walk in where your sign in is that's actually considered the back of the room they'll be coming up those stairs and through those double doors so we might just we might want to just rejigger a little bit but i love the idea and um uh, aside from that everything looks great okay thank you for that that's extremely helpful <laughs> um okay yeah i can we can move this around that's easy um okay that's all i have just on the run of show and sort of explanation of what Emily and I have been thinking about uh, in terms of the meeting. Great. Uh, Gina, it looks like you have a question. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, it has to do with process. And that is, uh, since we are unable to uh, look and respond to uh, the presentation tonight, what? how are we going to do that? Are, are individual members going to um, send comments to staff or do we have to um, schedule another meeting before the community meeting? Um, how How is input going to be processed? And I don't um, know if Lee wants to respond to that. I think Katie has some uh, response. Katie? Yeah. I'm um, just a thought um, that, you know, for the presentation, I think if I'm understanding correctly what Eric laid out, the presentation is really what is the requirements under MBTA communities and what are the stations in the room. Um, so there's there's not, I guess I would love to hear from the group if you feel like you need to see those slides and need to give feedback. I think we were assuming um, that maybe that was not necessary because it's not 
um, going beyond just an overview of like, what is the law? Yeah, if I can just say, I mean, I think one of the, one of the reasons that we decided to bring only these two maps and to shift the focus from the maps to the stations was because we didn't want people to get too hung up on the actual zoning, because the point is that it's not decided yet. We don't want people debating, you know, this, this little parcel and that little parcel. And um, so I actually think that it's okay that we're not seeing them tonight, that we're not previewing them in that way, because we know what they're going to be, more or less. And that the most important part of this presentation is making sure that people leave with an understanding of how these, these pieces can be manipulated to achieve the right outcome. We'll still see the maps and then in the and then moving after that, I think we'll have to have to get into the, the nitty gritty with the maps. But I think this this particular meeting was was always meant to be here's the here's the bottom line of what we're trying to achieve. Well, if I can make another comment, uh, then um, I think that um, these uh, uh, these scenarios for modeling uh, need to identify the particular zoning districts that are sh being shown on the maps, um, because otherwise people will be completely lost and not know what we're talking about. Um, and do you it, mean call out the name of the district, Jean? Yeah. Or Okay. Like, I mean, general residence, because I know we're not using that anymore. Business, uh, Garden Street overlay, just a little arrow pointing to it, because um, those are the those are the districts we're talking about. In in, you know, in the prior in the table that lists them all, we have all of the zoning just the scenarios for modeling table that lists them all. Uh, one, two, three, four. Eric, One, two, three, four, five, six of them. Correct. Am I but, correct to think that each of those tables are going to have a map showing that type of district? Yeah, I apologize. I understand why Jean is making the comment that she is. In the presentation that was sent out for tonight that I was going to give, just because of the time that we had to do everything, I, we didn't have time to sort of make all new zoning district maps for each of those five districts that were labeled. So that's why an entire district is pink or blue or red. We were we were just trying to get the modeling done in time for tonight's meeting. For the public meeting, that will not be how we do it. We will show the district, we will show the mapping, how we showed it at the at the, I guess at the first meeting where all the zoning districts were called out. They all had different colors to them. They were all labeled GR, industrial. So yeah, it's gonna be done that way. We we would never do it the way we did it for this meeting tonight. It was just trying to get it done in the amount of time we had. Okay, thanks for then that. Have just one more comment on the levers. Um, one of the factors um, I understand in the, mo in the modeling and an important factor in general is how much parking is required per unit? Um, the town recently did a parking study and the study was focused on our downtown, but the consultants also studied um, some multifamily within walking distance of the town downtown uh, to see, and they did parking counts, you know, at appropriate times when all the cars would be there and made some recommendations that, you know, we were, that our standard of one and a half spaces per um, unit uh, was higher than it needed to be. And uh, I'd like to know what are people's point, what are people's views about that? And especially, I mean, if it weren't even a factor in the uh, in the modeling, uh, you might say, well, who cares? Think about that later. But it is a factor in the modeling, and it'd be good to know what people think. Um, well, this is Ron, if I can interject. I, I tend to think that we, we're already giving people the four variables of lot size, lot coverage, height, and dwelling. The vast majority of people who come to this thing are not zoning professionals or not land use people at all. And my own thought is that, that uh, I'd rather keep it with this group than get into the parking discussion, which can be a little inflammatory and ultimately isn't going to drive the bus on this thing. I mean, my own two cents is I want to hear what the citizenry has to say big picture not mm -hmm. not focused on parking but that's mm -hmm. my two it's it's also true that we have 
additional opportunities to bring in parking. Oh, um, absolutely. This is, in my view, this is one of three meetings we're having. Um, but I, I do think it's a, you know, it's a fair point, Gene. Um, absolutely. We do have to address it, but I think it's a, um, it's only, like, only, it could, it, it can be an accessory to the dwell, to the zoning, not the primary focus, because we want the, the buildings to be the primary focus right now. Yeah. Just a thought. Um, Liz, Just you have a question? Uh, yes, I have a, like a couple questions, a comment. Um, I just, um, one thing is, I don't know if you plan to have a handout, maybe a two, three page handout for the, um, for the people that come in to sort of summarize certain things so they can kind of mull, mull it over when they get home. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise there's an awful lot of information. We're kind of familiar with it because we've had several meetings, but the members of the public, I, I think that would be, they're getting overwhelming information. So maybe some kind of a handout should be made for, for the people. And um, the other thing is, I think we should put up front that Needham's responsibility with that MBTA Act is to come up with 1,784 multi-dwelling units, um, you know, or, or, or more, but um, that's the number that we have been assigned to by the state, by the law, and I think that should be up front so people understand that. Um, and also, just this is a comment, was sort of a comment and a question. I noticed with this um, revised modeling that, um, you know, I have in front of me the packet, the information packet, that right now um, what's proposed is 5,183 mm -hmm. units. And I just did some quick math. That's pretty much three times what we are legally required to come up with. And I was wondering, is there a particular reason that... Um, because Newton only had about twice as much in their plan. Um, and I'm wondering, is there a reason? Because then you will be ex expecting people to not want the buildings to be so high here or so dense there, so that you sort of have a buffer so that you can still come up with the required units. What What is the reason you went like three times more than we need? Okay, so... Just to be clear, it's not the consultants who went three times more than we need. It's the housing plan working group that created that plan. And we did that before we actually had the all the compliance modeling to check. So what we did was we took our existing zoning and then we added to it in a way that we thought was reasonable. But we didn't have a way to, to check what the outcome would be. So... Um, that's what we're doing now. Like that's that's the stage that we're at is to look at what the outcome is and how do we want to to tweak it and what is our objective? Is our objective to comply, period, or is our objective to overachieve? <laughs> and um, so so I think that you, you're you're absolutely right in saying that we are at that stage, but it's not, it, we're, we're not past it yet. We're still trying to determine what we want our outcome to be. Um, right. Heidi, may I you? add, um, a, a, a big factor in coming up with the very large numbers was including general residents. And the housing plan working group never thought that we could uh, use general residents um, as, um, as a multifamily um, factor. So when you deduct that column, um, you you get a lot fewer. You still was it still comes out nicely with a compliant figure, but uh, much lower than what's shown now. So this is part of what we're just trying to determine. These are just two like the existing and what we've already suggested, and now is the time when we need to decide. Needham needs to decide what we want this to be for the community. Um, does that answer that question? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, it does. It's, 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 I, I guess it's, it's in, in, in its evolution, it's evolving. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I just uh, speak to the handout thing just real quick? Um, because I, I think that you're, you're 
right, Liz? It's great for people to have something to look at after. But personally, as you know, the tree hugger that we all know that I am, I think it's, um, I think it's, it, these are not things that people actually do look at. So if we were going to provide something for people to take home, I would prefer instead of a multi-page packet, especially one that has colors because of all these mapping colors, I think um, a, a slip of paper that has a reminder that they can find all of this information on the website in a week, including, uh, you know, a recording to watch it over again, or if they're just, you know, a big fan, or if they want to see any of the levers and stations and so on. Um, oh, yeah. Or maybe also uh, maybe a QR code. I see that's very popular. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Something they can just do right on their phone, or we can yeah. post, you know, on the website, which they should have because everyone got a postcard. Um, so just, just a thought. Um, I'm not opposed to the idea. I think it's a good one, but I think it's time for us to start being you know sustainable as we try to do that as well and um, the powerpoint would be available for people who love to keep their printer working uh, to print it out <laughs> later no emily did you have something if i may yes um uh we've been using um menu holders to put up a sheet of paper that has a qr code and also a short link um, to the website so that people can take a picture of it and take the picture home, um, less paper, uh, but it's also very visible because it's standing up and we usually scatter that throughout the room. Uh, and uh, we used it last night, for example, and I saw people taking pictures of it, so it worked. <laughs> Perfect. I, I personally, I take those things home all the time and then I recycle them. So um, anyway, um, who else, what next? Um, I'd like to ask Emily if she could go over the, um, the board design. Emily, I do have it pulled up if it's easier or I can, or you can share screen, whatever you want. I've got it up as well. I figured, uh, we'd probably okay. be talking to it. So I'll okay. just share my screen. Um, I will not start with a would be general residence. So I'm not going to start with that. Um, uh, and this is also obviously mocked up. Uh, Eric mentioned in his presentation that there will be pictures. You notice there are no photographs in here, but I did have little um, icons and diagrams to remind myself of what I want to put photographs for. So um, for the uh, primary calculations and the compliance model, there are six factors. We talked about them at our last meeting. Eric and I went back and forth on six factors starts to be a lot for people to think about at any given station. Um, and to Heidi's point about buildings and what people want to um, experience as they're moving through space, uh, we decided that lot size, lot coverage, height, and dwelling units per acre um, would be something that'd be a little bit easier to visualize for people. So that's my job is to go find those photographs. Um, and so what you see here is the, the lever is set to the existing um, uh, zoning. Um, we've got these boxes that people can put their little dots in. I actually thought about a cross between a lever and a thermometer so that the, um, the color can go up if they want to go up or it can go down if they want to go down. Um, and obviously we'll have explanations for the volunteers plus uh, who are going to be at each station so they know how to talk about each of these. Um, Eric did mention the idea of breaking up the business districts, which uh, initially when we were trying to limit it to four, we had general residential. We had combined business, Avery Square, Chestnut and Hillside Avenue. But in fact, business, uh, the, the Avery Square, Chestnut Street and Hillside Avenue all have similar requirements. Business is slightly different. So if we have that opportunity to swap out stations, I think I would break out business because uh, it makes a lot of sense uh, to do that. And so our idea is that people would be able to go, they'd be um, prepped by the presentation as to what we would like them to think about and consider. They'll have photographs uh, or other images, uh, depending on what we find that best communicate. Um, each of these uh, requirements um, so they can respond to those. And then um, we'll ask them to think about, well, what makes sense for this area? Uh, as Eric mentioned, they'll have the map there. So they'll be able to see the geography as well as the, the potential. So 
Um, that's the general idea. And then uh, in terms of the um, way to do this online, uh, Eric mentioned uh, um, the Moreau board, which is an online way of we can put up this exact same image. We can create little dots. And uh, as we're talking, we can ask people where they want their dot to go and put that for them. So same sort of visual online. Uh, the nice thing about that for this committee is that we can export the Moreau boards as PDFs. So just as we will have photographs of the boards that are done in real life, you will have that same image, uh, same ability to see what people did as a PDF. Um, so uh, it's uh, really powerful being able to do the hybrid uh, exercises and then pretty much the same way we'll be able to do them in person. Um, I also have one for center business, although uh, depending on um, how we want to talk about that, uh, that may lead more to the visual aspects of center business, but I was kind of interested to see what it would look like compared to the others in terms of the uh, levers, but I think that board will end up being more photograph based of building types. Uh, to answer the questions that Eric put in his presentation. I was just interested. Uh, but we're hoping that these visualizations, um, uh, I'd love to get your feedback on them. And if you think that they uh, read well enough to convey what, um, what people need to do in terms of, of moving the, the lever up and down, depending on their preferences. This is Ron. Can I just ask you to go back and uh, say again what you said with regard to center business and why that would become more visual? I didn't quite follow. So we had talked about um, uh, center business in terms of thinking whether or not people wanted to have multifamily allowed there as opposed to the mixed use with the required ground floor commercial. Um, so the dimensional standards might not. I'm, I'm interested in your feedback on that. Certainly we could do it the exact same as the others and just have the images in the, the boxes here and have the, the dimensional standards available. I don't know if you feel that having the dimensional standards um, as part of the conversation is more important than the multifamily versus commercial conversation or multifamily versus mixed use conversation. So if that, if the uses are more important, then I would shake this board up to be more about what's there now and what could be there, you know, side by side, a multifamily versus a mixed use. Um, if you like this the way it is, I would just choose slightly different images to illustrate this than I would the other districts. Well, personally, I'm just obviously speaking for myself. Uh, the, uh, in my mind, the there is obviously the discussion about the trade-off between mixed use and residential, but there is, at least in my mind, the potential for, uh, for heightened density in the downtown area that is less available, and at least in my mind, in other areas. So uh, keeping those, at least, those two kinds. I'm, I'm not sure that lot size and lot coverage, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those those are a little different in a center of business, business district, but uh, uh, so that's my two cents. I agree and with in, that. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, to your point, some of these use FAR rather than lot coverage, so I may actually switch it out to FAR. The only reason we didn't do that to start with is because FAR can be a difficult conversation for non-zoning people. Yep. And so keeping it all to lot coverage made sense. And then we in our conversations can translate it back to FAR. Yeah, makes sense. So, sorry, I'm just, um, I just want to make sure that I'm looking at this correctly. If the central business district uses the FAR, we're talking about a unit per acre floor. Mm -hmm. Not as and the as... FAR is for um it's a relationship between the lot size and the gross square footage of a building. So it is comparable to the use in many ways, um, it is comparable to the use of lot coverage to restrict uh the building. They're not precisely equal, but that's why they're in the same column. Um the dwelling units per acre uh um 
isn't directly comparable to the FAR. It's more about what's fitting in there, whereas the FAR is a dimensional standard about how that essentially governs the massing of the building. Um, mm -hmm. The dwelling units per acre really talks more about what's inside that mass of the building. Um, yeah, my I guess my two cents would be just that I think the residential versus mixed use is mm -hmm. one of the most important factors in the center. Yeah, I was also going to ask, because, you know, um, in the center, it's I think you're modeling here, you're showing basically the underlying rules, but then there's the overlay that kind of lets you get up actually to three stories and four stories in a portion of the center, which would probably make this very confusing. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I, it is better to kind of stay foot more focused around the issue of the use, which is the question we're trying to answer. And yeah, and I, I kind of feel like... Um... In this particular case, especially with residential versus mixed use, having a lot of pictures will be more illustrative for people than any of than any of this in this particular zone. Okay, that is the feedback I was hoping to get from you all, is which which would be more useful. So that's terrific. Thank you. And Emily, the idea would be for each of those. Um, sort of green boxes, like for lot size, where it says 30,000, 20,000, 10,000, 5,000, it, it would have, we'd have like an example of what that looks like in real life. So all of those boxes that you see, even for lot coverage height, dwelling units per acre, we're going to try to identify local Needham examples where we can, if not examples from the region. So there'll actually be photos replacing those boxes. We just didn't have the time to grab all those photos yet. I wanted to give you an idea of what it what we would be thinking about in terms of this, but Eric's absolutely right. All of these will be photos. And then what I'll do is I'll shift this board to be more photos. And Ron, I think we can still test the height on center business just by the photos that we choose to use. So we can give examples of commercial and mixed use and multifamily at different building heights to get a sense of what people like there. But this would be more like if you all have heard of a visual preference survey, this uh, center, which uh, takes a look at images and asks people to uh, indicate which they prefer visually. <laughs> That's the name, um, uh, but this would be more like a miniature visual preference survey of the of the uses and the buildings that would contain those uses, whereas the rest of these would be much more targeted to the specific dimensional standards. I, th I think what you're proposing makes sense, Emily. <laughs> so okay. any any other questions on this? not, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Okay, so is that, that is the end of your presentation tonight, correct? So now that we've seen the whole thing. No, so it's you're, not the end. No, it's not, not the end. end. No, <laughs> I, Bring it on. So the, Don't be shy. No, sorry. <laughs> So the last thing that we were asked to do, I think at the last committee meeting was to put together just an outline of the 15 minute presentation that we would like to give at the beginning of the public meeting. So I have that. Hopefully that won't take long since I think it's fairly straightforward, but um, let me just share that real quick. Then we'll be done. Well, I do want to ask for volunteers, Heidi, just before we, before we sure. part. So, okay. So just in terms of the purpose, what I think I heard last time was We'll briefly introduce MBTA 3A. What is it? What isn't it? Uh, as I think Elizabeth mentioned before, what are Needham's requirements? I think it's important for people to at least have their heads wrapped around that. We'll discuss the levers in zoning that actually drive unit capacity and density and sort of like how those integrate into this whole MBTA 3A thing and why we're asking people to engage in this conversation uh, that evening. I'll then describe the table and station exercises, and then most importantly, how they're actually, how people's feedback is actually going to be used to shape both the districts and the zoning going forward, and then um, just sort of share the timing and the report out structure. So that's kind of the purpose of the presentation. Um, and then just briefly <laughs> breaking that down into those four pieces, um, we would introduce MBTA 3A. What is the law? What does it say at a very high level? describe what the intention of the law is and also what it's not, I think is really important for people to understand. 
note that there are penalties for non-compliance. So I just want to make that statement there and then share what Needham's requirements are and also the timeline that the town is under to complete uh, the compliance exercises and get everything submitted. We would then discuss the levers. So talking about the number of units and just overall density of an MBTA district and sort of how zoning relates directly to those unit count, unit capacity and density metrics in a very hopefully simple way. Then say in order to sort of drive unit capacity and density, there are certain levers that we could pull in zoning that will either increase that number or decrease that number um, as development occurs. Explain what those levers are and that then they're going to see them uh, on the boards. What I'd like to do in the presentation is just include some really sort of simple illustrations of like how those levers work, but then also how those levers help sort of, I guess, help or hinder constrain each parcel so that at the end of the day, we're getting down to a building envelope. So I think that's important for people to sort of see visually, like how is a parcel constrained by open space and parking, and essentially we're left with the building envelope. Once we're left with that building envelope, then it's important to talk about height and density. And, you know, if we talk about parking requirements, whatever else we talk about. Um, so that would just be the discussion and the introduction to the levers, hopefully making that more graphical than written on a slide. Uh, I would just describe the stations and the exercises, all the stuff that we went over with the run of show. I would I would talk to folks about that, tell them what they're going to see, what we're asking them to do, and then just share. We have an hour for the table and station exercises. Then we'll come back as a large group. We'll do the report out both in person and hybrid, and then we'll have a wrap up and then people will go. So in 15 minutes, you know, this will, again, have to be pretty high level. 15 minutes is not a lot of time, but I know we don't want to drown people in data and information and things, at least not at this stage. So that may come later. And that's all I have on the presentation. Katie? I just wanted to flag that, you know, we had talked with Eric and Emily about making sure we explicitly say we're not going to be taking questions at the end of that presentation, but we have that MBTA communities table that Eric will be staffing. So we'll direct folks there, but I just, I don't want to get anybody on this committee surprised by that. Um, but if we open it up to Q&A, I think um, we lose our whole timeline. So. Sure. For sure. Um, Liz? Uh, yes. Um, when, um, when we're talking about doing the presentation outline, um, are we going to use that large screen and have slides as um, I think it's going to be Eric that will be making that presentation? Are we going to use slides? That's my hope, yes. Okay, because we have a nice screen at Town Hall. Great. Kevin? Yeah, hey, um, for the stations and exercises, I have a sense that having been to some of these, that people leave after they place their stickers. They'll say the part with stickers and then they'll walk out. So you might lose some of your audience. It's fine, but I'm not sure they'll stay around for the reporting out. Yeah. I, I think there'll be just a natural ebb and flow to it and they'll go. I agree. Yeah. That's okay. I mean, they'll be able to see it later if they need to. Yep. What's up, Jean? Um, two things. Oh, I was looking again at the at the levers, um, and um, I I wonder if it would be better to use FAR uh, because it's the exception that a lot of coverage is used for our districts in Needham. Mean, it's only the uh, business district that's a really old one that hasn't been changed in decades that uses a lot of coverage. So wouldn't F FAR be the better factor to be be showing? And if we have to show business separately, we'll just show it separately. Um, so that's one question. And then the other thing is, um, I, I feel as though I should apologize because I started talking about how various uh, areas that should be added. Um, and of course, the, the, the um, scenarios for modeling that we were looking at that we were provided with were for existing zoning and clearly labeled that way so they wouldn't be showing areas that should be added so i apologize for even focusing on that issue but um i just wonder if we should use far rather than uh um, lot coverage 
Anybody have any thoughts on that? I'm open to using FAR. I think it's up to all of you. Are. I, um, I think, uh, Eric, if we do use FAR, we'll uh, just need to add a slide in the presentation that explains what it is. I think even though all of us who have been working with uh, zoning or the, the built environment for a while may be familiar with FAR, um, it's not even after um, sort of years of it being around, it's still not a common concept for people. So we may just need to, if we use it, and I'm fine with that, certainly fine with that, um, we just need to think about how we explain that to people. And it may be a little bit more difficult to illustrate than lot coverage with existing pictures. I'll have to think about that. It can be done, obviously it can be done. I just have to think about it a little bit, but mm -hmm. I'm happy to do that if people agree. Mm -hmm. I think it makes sense because that's really what the requirement is in, in those three districts. So I think we should probably maybe stay with what the standard is. Yep, that's fine. I'll make a note to change it to FAR for those. Okay. Uh, Bill? Thank you, Jean. Hi, good evening. Um, these look fantastic, the charts. I did have a question with regard to restrictions, and I apologize if I missed this. Um, is there going to be some guidance given to the, you know, I'm just by way of example, it's not going to be possible to do, um, you know, a minimum lot size of 10,000 with, you know, 30% lot coverage and, you know, one story and still get 18 acres or 18 units per acre density. Is there going to be some guidance to the public about that? I was thinking in the presentation, we would try to illustrate an example like that. We would take a, you know, whatever the size parcel is, Bill, we could use 10,000 square feet and say, just remember out of all these levers, you, you know, there are levers and there's still open space and parking requirements. So everything is sort of subtractive, you know, from the 10,000 square feet. So once you're left with whatever this building footprint is, and you multiply it by the height, you know, that's basically your, your really your FAR restriction. It's a volumetric measure of, of density. So yeah, I, I was thinking that we would have like some kind of an illustration that would walk people through those steps and then say, it's really important for you to think about all these steps, you know, together. I know it's hard, but it's important because the more you restrict the building footprint, maybe more height you would need, right, to make up for the volume. Exactly. that you would need to get the unit. So yeah, I think your point is was well taken. And I wonder too in the presentation if it just should be reiterated that the the overall objective is, you know, the minimum number of units per acre on the average. So you're not so everyone understands that you can't go into each district and, you know, have this necessarily the same rules, right? Across or you know, it can't all be, you know, if it's all going to be four story and, you know, 75% lot coverage, then you're going to be way, way in excess of the requirement. Conversely, you can't have all one story, right? You know, you can have one story in some areas. I think, you know, some type of example to that effect would be helpful too, that this is an average across the entirety. Yep. I, I agree. Thank you. Um, fantastic job, you two, uh, Emily and Eric. You really making such a complicated subject comprehensible. So uh, we really appreciate your input. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, if there aren't any more questions on the presentation, now's your chance. Then we're gonna move along to Amy. Oh, wait a minute, um, Jean. <laughs> I just I just noticed something. Um, that um, the column that ha focuses on our existing business district, just business, not Hillside Avenue business. Um, it does, I, I was looking this up today, an apartment or multifamily dwelling is expressly prohibited in the business district. So was the um, eight units per acre there um, because it allowed general residence as a, a, a use? So we'll be taking that business out of existing zoning, won't we? The eight, uh, uh, to answer your second question, Jean, yeah, I, I 
it's up to, uh, a week and a half ago. So I'd have to check it again, but I believe it was because it allowed the uh, lower density residential residence on residence, there. Yeah. So we won't even be putting in the, the business district. Okay. It's an important one when it comes to uh, proposed zoning, because I think it's one of the most um, likely uh, areas to have uh, some housing development come along, but not for the existing zoning for sure. Kevin? Just, just a question, did Eric, did you want to pick up who was going to volunteer for what component of the present of the, of the workshop? Thank yeah, you. that would be great if we could do that really quickly. And then I could sort of fill it in on the fly. Um, just where I have it listed in yellow, um, I was hoping just to get some volunteer names. So if we could just go down the list, um, maybe Heidi, if you want to help me um, for welcome and sign in, if there's a, two two people. Liz? I'll do it. Kevin? Sure. Right. Um, and then, well, this will be... <laughs> One of the business stations. I just need two volunteers here. You can put me Happy. anywhere. Likewise. This is Natasha. Yeah. You, you can put me anywhere also. Same. Same for Bill. Happy yeah. to go anywhere. Same for Michael. Wait. Um, I know everyone was kind of saying it once, which I do appreciate, but uh, <laughs> anybody for uh, industrial? Natasha somewhere? and Bill both. Natasha and Bill love it. Um, and then for the apartment one, I think she yeah, you I, wanted to. I, I already said I'd do that. Yeah. I'm happy to do that one too. Yeah. And then um, Ron, can I put you down on this one? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. And Lee and Alex, I have you on the zoning station in the center business. I hope that's okay. That's Michael, fine. Are you your hand for a question or to volunteer? Uh, that that uh, column on collect responses on general residence district questions, we won't be having that, right? That Heidi Frail and Michael. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. It's just... All right. Fabulous. Well done. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to move on to Amy Halson, who's going to review our community engagement strategy. Take it away. All right. Well, thanks. So it sounds like so many people received the postcard, which went out in um, early um, in mid September, I should say. Um, just about everybody that I have asked has said they've received it. So that's that's great news on that. Um, I'm just curious: is anybody here not received that lives in Needham not received? You yeah. didn't receive it, but everyone I've talked to has gotten theirs. Okay. Well, let's hope it's that's a fluke that you didn't receive yours. So, um, so those were all sent out. Um, as far as getting the word out for November 9th, um, I am going to draft a press release, send it to the Needham Observer, the Needham Channel, slash Needham Note Local, Hometown Weekly, the Charles River Chamber. Ask him, um, ask Greg Reebman to include it in his weekly mm -hmm. newsletter. Um, we're going to post information on the town's website, send a news flash out to um, the subscribers to the town's website uh, put an announcement in the newsletter every week leading up to November, November 9th, just to remind people. Um, we can send out a targeted email message as well. We have on uh, nearly 6,000 subscribers, so we could actually send uh, a specific targeted uh, message out just about the event itself. I will post on the, I'll post it on the town's social media pages every week leading up to November 9th um, as far as flyers. I've had a lot of conversations with community groups, the executive director of Needham Housing Authority, and um, I'm in the process of reaching out to senior housing complexes, um, apartment complexes to ask if flyers can be posted in sort of common areas or the mail room, that sort of thing. I'm gonna, flyers will be distributed to local nonprofits, I mean, electronically, uh, community groups, religious organizations, school PTCs. Um, I on Monday night was um, on a panel for the League of Women Voters and and pitched it there as well. So, you know, if we all continue to just let people know that this is happening, that would be great. Um, I'm also going to send information to um, the staff liaisons to town boards and committees and ask um, them to forward the flyers on to their respective members as well. So um, the goal is that 
no matter you know where you look, you'll you'll see this information. And the goal is to, to make sure that everybody's well aware that this event is happening on November 9th. And certainly the same efforts will be made for the follow-up workshops as well. Amazing. Hmm. Eric, I think we're gonna need some more people. <laughs> Just hoping Powers Hall is going to be big enough. <laughs> I haven't been assigned to anything, so I'm certainly happy. I'll, I'll be there. So if you want to assign me to any of the stations or any tasks, certainly feel free to do so. Great. I was uh, one question I was going to ask, just for all the Needham folks, is how many people do you typically get to an in-person meeting, just so Emily and I can have, you know, a reasonable amount of materials. Depends on how controversial it is, you know. Yeah. I don't it's know. In the, so past for, in the past for our zoning stuff, when we when we did the work on Needham Center, we would probably get 120 people, 130 people. Yeah. How many of you had virtually and virtual meetings or hybrid? That I can't answer. Okay. I'm thinking, uh, Eric, I'm just thinking we may want to be prepared to do breakout rooms. So um, we can talk about that later, just in yep. case. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, can Hi, we? This, this is Natasha, Heidi, just a, a quick question. Does anyone know if any, there's a lot of activism at the high school. To, and I remember that there was something at Powers Hall for all the high school students to t talk about different issues. There were some that were about housing. Is there a way of connecting them to this initiative so that they can get the word out as well? That was done through the civics class in the junior year. Uh, I'll ask Kathy. Yeah, Kathy, that might know. Kathy, she's the how one. to connect, and she also, um, well, the League of Women Voters also has a club at the high school, so we could we could ask them. I'm just wondering, Amy, can we make can we send an email about this meeting to town meeting members as well? Yes, that's a good idea. Oh, yeah. Well, meeting members will be the one ones ultimately deciding, you know, Indeed. In the, Liz? In the 2024 yes. um, special town meeting. Yeah. Well, you know, I have attended many of these meetings uh, through the years at Powers Hall and, and, and you're lucky to get 100 people. That's a very big turnout. But I must say that none have been promoted so professionally as our meeting. I think we're going to get a bunch of people to show up. Thank you. I hope so. Um, I do think that we got a pretty good response at the parking study. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I recall there being quite a few people there, but anyway, um, sometimes it's hard to tell in such a large room. Um, all right. Well, Amy, that sounds like you've got it covered. So thank you for all that work. Um, all right. Anything else? Anybody else have anything they want to discuss, contribute prior to? Our next meeting is the community meeting. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, Great. I, I, I just want to say that um, all of us should be provided with uh, the copy of the updated PowerPoint well ahead of the meeting because we got to prepare ourselves to be able to answer questions based on the information that's in the PowerPoint, right? Uh, that when you... Or are we going down to the line with that? What's that? I'm just asking, Will will is that something that's doable? Um, I just want a clarification from Jean. When you say PowerPoint, you mean the 15-minute PowerPoint that's going to be shared yes. with them yeah um yeah you'll get that uh yeah you'll get that ahead of time yeah good yeah. okay all right so everyone uh november 9th our volunteers are going to come early and be ready to uh to staff our tables. Natasha, um, I know you were unavoidably detained. You and I are going to come up with something very sage to say at the beginning of this um, open meeting <laughs> prior yes. to the 
prior to the presentation and then a little something to close us out as well. So we, me, you and I can maybe touch base on that. Yes, sounds good, <laughs> thank you. normal setting. So, um, all right, well then I think, I think we're all set unless anyone has any questions at the last. And if not, then I would welcome a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Excellent. I don't, I never remember if we need a roll call vote here. Katie? Uh, have... You do. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Well, in that case, uh, Liz. Uh, yes. Move to adjourn. Kevin. Yes. Michael. Yes. Dean. Yes. Natasha. Yes, and thank you, Heidi, for doing all of this. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, Bill. Yes. And I vote yes, so we are adjourned. Yes. And Ron votes yes. Oh, sorry, Ron. You are all moving <laughs> no. around. <laughs> Don't want to be recorded as a baby, especially Thanks, on everyone. this function. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a